The social gatherings of choice for little Austrian girls at the turn of the last century were known as Krenschen. These were genteel tea parties, only with cocoa instead of tea, and school friends could dress up and have a chat and play games and generally re-enact their middle-class mother's social lives. Leontine Schlesinger hated them. Oh, but she loved them too. And she hated the tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girls who would insist on inviting her and then sideline her once she got there. But she loved them too, or found herself admiring them for their confidence and physical beauty. She, however, was something of a curiosity in their eyes. She was their Jewish school friend, dark-haired, dark-eyed, angular, awkward. They were never unkind to her, never forgot to invite her, but she was an outsider all the same. There's a cockiness that comes of being in the dominant crowd. At school, Leontine watched as these confident girls tried it on with the teacher. They simply didn't care if they were punished, and seeing as they didn't care, the punishment was fruitless in any case. She cared. Punishment was humiliating and caused even greater inner turmoil, and so she kept quiet and went along with the system. As soon as she could, she'd escape these parties and make a break for it and sprint for home, only instead of ducking into the house, she'd swerve past it and climb up the hill behind it. Her heart would be pounding, her eyes wet, and the physical exertion would go some way to ease the pain of being so different. And these, it ought to be noted, were her happiest school days. You're listening to The Kiss, the story of the women who made a movie masterpiece. And this is episode four, Shouting from the Mountain. The irony is that these socially exclusive little tea parties were taking place not in Vienna or indeed any other fashionable European city but in the country to which Leontine's father had dragged his family precisely to get away from stifling social convention, South Africa. Leontine and her self-assured classmates were Central European expats girls attending the German school in Johannesburg, all with the same cultural reference points. Here they all were, in this great, big, busy melting pot, a milling international mass of adventurers, chancers and prospectors, with their dependent families adapting to life in Africa in the only way they could, by recreating the old country wherever possible. Leontine's parents and three siblings came from a German-speaking, secular, Western Jewish tradition. They had nothing ostensibly in common with the larger number of Yiddish-speaking Jews arriving in South Africa from Poland and Russia. There was no collective identity at this point among the region's Jewish immigrants, and perhaps this is why Leontine never liked to make much of her Jewishness in later life. In fact, she would be puzzled that other German speakers like herself, other lovers of German literature should consider her to be from an alien race. The Schlesinger mother and children had needed to be coaxed to South Africa by their father, Isidore. Though from a well-to-do family, Isidore couldn't bear class-ridden Europe. He found the old world stolid and uninspiring, the new world exciting and full of promise. His Austrian wife, Emma, however, was not enamoured of the thought of leaving Vienna and her family. This vibrant, glamorous city, the hub of the Habsburg Empire, with its fashionable café culture, was everything that Emma considered home and Isidore found false and suffocating. And so he had gone abroad without them at first, in an effort to recoup the fortune he'd already lost in the Kimberley diamond mines. Doughty, spirited Emma Schlesinger stayed behind to raise the children single-handed and set about finding work to feed them all. Not only did she end up providing very well for her two girls and two boys, but also gifted her younger daughter a template for fierce independence that she took with her for the rest of her life. Around this time, not so far away, but over the border in Germany, the young Krista Winslow was learning a very different maternal lesson. The gentle Katerina Winslow, nurturing and dutiful, was an archetype of love and acquiescence. 
a near beatific figure who bought wholly into the notion of service that came with her noble class. Krista adopted her mother's softness and devotion, a yearning for peace and purpose, and was rarely comfortable in the foreground. Leontine's mother, on the other hand, was a lioness, an attractive, lively woman, gregarious and a born raconteur. She had a lot to contend with and rattled through life like a storm in an effort to deal with it all. Where the aristocratic Katerina Winslow acquiesced, the middle-class Emma Schlesinger put her foot down and made her presence felt. Her marriage was a challenge to which she had no choice but to rise. When the call came from her lonely husband in 1899 to pack everything up and ship out to South Africa, she really didn't want to, but she did it anyway, determined that she'd make this risky venture work for her and the children. Leontine was nine years old, a little Austrian girl as robust, inquisitive and characterful as her mother. She had no memory of her father, no idea what he looked like and no particular yearning for him either. When father and daughter eventually met in Africa, there was no heart-rending reunion. Emma and the children alighted from what had seemed an endless train journey through the Transvaal and a man had rushed up to them and shouted out their names. Leontine's older sister had called this stranger Papa, and he'd embraced them all, euphoric at the sight of them. Only little Leontine remained stony-faced, appalled at this man's effrontery in being so affectionate with her family. The timing of Emma and the children's arrival in South Africa was spectacularly poor. Within mere months of their settling in the frontier town of Klerksdorp, the Boer War broke out. Klerksdorp was right in the thick of it, the site of a British concentration camp for Boer women and children. The war, to someone like Isidore Schlesinger and his friends in Klerksdorp, was a sad state of affairs and a huge inconvenience, but not an issue of partisanship or ideology. In the Dutch-controlled states of Transvaal and Orange Free State, which the Boer settlers believed had been given to them by God, these non-Boers were considered foreigners or Uitlanders. They were denied the vote by President Paul Kruger, but the German-speaking ones were later more or less left alone in Kruger's war against the British. Nonetheless, Leontine and her mother and older sister were shipped out to the relative safety of Johannesburg, where they instantly discovered an expat community which sent its daughters to the German school and hosted their seemingly innocuous little Kränzchen. Leontine was young enough to enjoy her African adventure and not feel the intense culture shock experienced by her poor mother and older sister, both of whom missed Vienna profoundly. They had exchanged a charmed life of extended family, good friends, exquisite food and eternal music for the vast silent blank of the South African veldt. To say it was different was nowhere near close to the mark. It was another planet. In previous episodes, I've talked about how Krista Winslow struggled to fit into her strict Prussian circle. Leontine, just two years younger than Krista, grew up in very different circumstances, but was just as assailed by her sense of wrongness particularly when it came to her education. Leontine was never very keen on school, to say the least, and had a very peculiar sense of having walked into the wrong place at the wrong time. As well as the isolation she felt, particularly at those cake and cocoa parties with their in-jokes and flaxen plats, there was her impatience with formal learning. She was unquestionably an autodidact, but a selective one. She was in love with literature. The rest could go hang. Back up on her hilltop, she not only read the great German poets, but declaimed them too. She loved the sound of the words as they scattered in the wind, took pains to form them clearly, roundly, resonantly. She was prodigiously good at it. 
When the German poet Friedrich Schiller's anniversary was celebrated at school, she was chosen to recite some of the poems before a large gathering. There were some nerves at first, but the overriding feeling at the end of it was that she dearly wanted to do it again and again. The headmaster's wife took Leontine's mother aside and suggested that she send her daughter to Europe for dramatic training. Emma Schlesinger laughed. There was no way they could afford to do that. The headmaster's wife offered to pay for it, insisting that such talent should not be squandered. Leontine listened to the exchange and her pulse quickened. Forget the dramatic training. She just longed to travel. The money was never forthcoming, the training a fantasy. She was still only young, her parents struggling financially. She would have to wait another two years before she set foot in the old country. Leontine's sister and two brothers managed to carve a contented life out for themselves in South Africa. Leontine and her mother never could. Both women would always be pulled between Europe and Africa. Just like her mother, Leontine had a love-hate attachment to the continent, longing for it when she was away from it, bored by it while she was there. Isidore might have absolutely no nostalgia for his old European life, but his wife couldn't permanently detach herself from hers. And when it came to their daughter's faltering education, it was going to have to be conducted in their old home country, no argument. Mother and daughter were going back to Vienna. In the Ringstrasse, well-heeled shoppers ambled from cafe to cafe. Women in furs, men in expensive suits. And among them sauntered a 13-year-old schoolgirl, happily anonymous in this relaxed crowd and extremely pleased with herself. To her, this glamorous parade was as good as theatre, not that she'd ever been to see a proper play. She loved what she observed of this elegance in the dynamic and charming capital of the Habsburg Empire, with its multi-ethnic population and vibrant appreciation of art and music. What a bustling contrast to provincial South Africa, where her life had been far more solitary. It was a lavishly dressed eyeful of society that might, you never know, welcome her as one of its own one day. And then Dad said, come home. Once again, here was that familiar letter that brought with it such turmoil and split loyalties. Isidore wanted them back in South Africa, couldn't understand why they didn't prefer it over Viennese society. And once again, Leontine's poor, peripatetic mother would have to take leave of her preferred life. While in Vienna, Leontine's mother had been the toast of her circle, full of dramatic tales of the Boer War and of South African politics. She was a vivid and gifted storyteller and held an audience easily in her palm. In Europe, she was an exotic oddity, a strong and opinionated woman who'd seen much of the world and come to conclusions of her own about it. Back in Johannesburg, she'd lose her audience and her exciting reputation. And so... Mother and daughter dragged their heels and made a meal of their return, stopping off in Berlin to savour a little more metropolitan life and high culture. Let's go to the theatre, suggested Emma when they arrived. Reinhardt is directing Gorky. Reinhardt is directing Gorky. A couple of names which conjured nothing particularly constructive in the girl's mind. Who was Reinhardt? What was a gawky? She'd never seen any proper theatre before, and her experience of literature was still something private and intensely personal. Leontine's mother couldn't have chosen a more auspicious production to introduce her daughter to the stage. The play was the Russian writer Maxim Gorky's The Lower Depths, and the production at the Kleines Theater was an international theatrical milestone. It was a huge popular success, and would go on to play 500 times in two years. This story of life among impoverished drunks, losers and prostitutes in a doss house by the Volga was a never-ending shuffle of character interaction, fights, accusations and arguments. 
mostly moments of despair. On stage, the actors slotted into bunks and nooks and corners like a drab human jigsaw puzzle. In the role of Luca the Tramp was Max Reinhardt himself, the revolutionary German stage director. Among the audience sat a teenage girl in the throes of transformation. Leontine was overwhelmed with longing. She didn't have any prior knowledge of the fame of these actors, of the fact that the production was already being hailed as a major cultural event. It was a blank canvas to her. She was moved by the plight of the characters, was immersed entirely in the story. What she wanted was to stand up too, just as these passionate people were doing, and to unburden herself as articulately as they could. She wanted to have the freedom to express herself, and in that way to relieve herself of her doubts and insecurities. She didn't wish to be the outsider looking in any longer. She didn't want to have to run up the hillside behind her house to give vent to her pent-up emotions. If she needed to scream, then she wanted to do it in this beautiful manner. Suddenly, in a great body blow of enlightenment, Leontine knew exactly what she was going to do with the rest of her life. In the next episode of The Kiss, we return to Krista and find that the fortunes of this impoverished young artist are about to change quite dramatically. The Kiss was written and presented by Bibi Berkey. Studio production was by Francis Nutbeam Webber. It was directed by Mark Lingwood, and the original music was composed by Timothy Bond. It was brought to you by Tempest Productions. <laughs> <laughs>